Well, g'day everyone. It's Glenn Morris from the Smart Energy Lab and it's Toolbox Tech Talk, slightly different today. I thought I'd do a pre-record because I can't always be live every Sunday at two o'clock, but I've still got some content I wanna deliver and I will be looking at the comments. So please feel free to put some comments in there, even questions, and I'll follow them up uh, after this goes live. I want to talk to you about today is designing a standalone power system. It's something it's close to my heart. You know, I've I've lived off grid almost all my adult life, uh, almost 30 years now. Actually, 30 years now, I've lived off grid. So I, I live and breathe it. I also teach it every day, well, every week or two, and I've got a lot of systems here designed for off grid at the Smart Energy Lab here in the Yarra Valley. So what I thought I'd do today is kind of give you a really simple somewhat dumbed down approach to designing a standalone power system. It's the way I run most of my courses is explaining this. And of course, I normally do this over five days. So you can imagine that I'm really cutting to the chase, but I'll be putting some of the formulas up on screen and, and cutting to some of the equations that you'll be using just so that you get an idea of um, how simple it is. Really um, multiply, divide, uh, add and subtract. That's all the maths you'll need to do this but you're gonna need some smarts around understanding appliance power ratings, their usage characteristics, their duty cycles even. Uh, these things that are important when understanding what the energy demand of an appliance is. So today I'll be talking all about energy. I'll be sizing a system for the certain size of a PV capacity and also for uh, an invert, sorry, for a battery capacity that will meet an energy load requirement. I won't be talking about sizing inverters for maximum demand. That's going to be another toolbox talk, tech talk, but I will focus very much on how to uh, size a PV array and a battery storage system to meet a load energy requirement. So first one, load energy requirement. That's where it all starts. So we really need to know what the customer's load energy is. Now I'm going to go through six steps. Um, a, B, C, D, E, F. That's it. Six steps uh, to size a system. And A is sizing for an energy demand. Now, we need to find out what the load energy requirements of the customer are. And that's actually one of the hardest things. The way to, you would do it if the customer is new, hasn't built a home, or doesn't have the appliances yet, is actually do a load sheet. Get them to estimate the usage of different appliances, find out what the power ratings of those appliances are, and use a bit of research. For instance, some appliances are difficult to understand. A light, for instance, you turn it on, it runs for a certain number of hours, it's very easy. It's watts uh, times time will give you watt hours, so that's energy. But an appliance like a fridge will cycle. It'll go through a cooling cycle and a rest and a cooling cycle and a rest. And so it's got what we call a duty cycle. And it's more difficult to estimate the watt energy requirements of a fridge, for instance, or a dishwasher or an air conditioner. But fortunately, for those of you who are in Australia and New Zealand, you can look these up and I'll, I'll put these um, up in the description, uh, in the well, actually, in the description below um, uh, where you can find this, but it's energyrating.gov.au. There's a New Zealand equivalent, which is ECA's website. Uh, it's the same website, actually, uh, but ECA share it with uh, the Australian government. So that's where every appliance that's rated with a star rating uh, is listed. And many of those appliances, which are cyclical, um, will give you kilowatt hours per annum usage based on a typical cycle. So for instance, a fridge basically is the appliance that you never turn off from the day you buy it. So it's on 24 seven every day of the week of the year. And the energy demand can be estimated using uh, uh, a logging equipment, which is what the energy rating website shows you. And you can divide that by 365, which is the number of days in the year to get a daily energy demand of something like a fridge or a freezer or anything that's used on a regular basis, like a dishwasher, one cycle per day, or a clothes washer, one cycle per day. Uh, they're all in the energy rating database. Uh, air conditioners are a bit more difficult because you don't normally leave them on 24 seven. Uh, well, I hope not because that's a big energy demand, uh, but they will have a input power rating 
an output power rating, which is their thermal, and uh, then you need to apply a duty cycle. So it's a little trickier, and I'll put some resources in the description below uh, where you can use uh, formulas to calculate something that's got a duty cycle, what its uh, energy demand per day is. So let's start with a, a worked example, basically, and I'll put this up on screen. Um, first up is we'll pick a load energy target. Now we've uh, got the customer to go through uh, their, well, or yourself, if, if you're doing this for yourself, to go through a load sheet uh, and do the formulas, work out what the watt hour demand is, and then try and reduce it. Now, look, uh, energy efficiency is your greatest friend. It saves you money from day one. It's not about just finding out what your energy demand is and then building a system for it. Well, if money is no uh, limitation, that's fine. But if you're concerned about cost efficiency, you'll be looking at energy efficiency first. So appliance selection. Uh, find appliances that, uh, that have a good star rating and often replacing an existing appliance, something that might have you know, like a three star rating, particularly if it was a three star rating from some years ago, uh, because the star rating scheme actually added extra two stars, um, some, I can't remember how long ago, five or 10 years ago. And so older devices with three stars are actually like one these days, they're really terrible. So uh, looking for a higher star rating can often mean a significant energy saving from day one. And if you cost that, and it's a really big cost, to build a system for that inefficient appliance, it's often better from day one just to go straight, cut to it, buy a more efficient appliance and recycle the old one. So we've gone through our load sheet, uh, we've looked for the bad guys, basically those who use a lot of energy per day and try to find the most efficient options. It could be changing the appliance, it could be changing the way you use it. Uh, for instance, you may just assume that you leave all your lights on all the time. Maybe it's more efficient to, to uh, have some sort of motion sensor or even just manually switch them off and get that demand down a bit. So in our example, we've got a uh, 9,000 watt hours per day uh, max uh, demand for energy for a home. Now that's, if you know, 9,000 watt hours or nine kilowatt hours per day is quite a modest figure. Uh, in Australia, uh, the average on grid for a home is about 20, 22 kilowatt hours per day. In New Zealand, it's slightly higher because more thermal loads for heating, so more like 25 kilowatt hours per day. So if you can get that load energy down to nearly half that through efficient appliance choice, that's great. So we're going for nine kilowatt hours per day for this off-grid design. The next step, remember there's six steps. So step one is find out what the load energy is, nine kilowatt hours per day or 9,000 watt hours per day. Uh, then the next step is to choose a system voltage. Now the reason we do this is because of the maths basically. It will roll through in terms of amp hour capacity of batteries, etc. But it also tells us something about the quality of uh, the equipment we connect. Now, if you're going for a 12 volt battery system, you're probably looking at uh, equipment design for recreational vehicles, things that really have uh, a, a small maximum demand, uh, low reliability, not used all the time. And so for 12 volts, you're generally at the low quality end. Now, that's not to say there isn't good quality 12 volt systems, but it gets hard to scale those up to get higher power ratings. So 12 volts really for RVs, very efficient small cabins, that's about it. When you go to 24 volts, uh, quality options really start to open up and there's a lot of choices, but I'd still say that's your modest uh, weekender uh, or larger cabin for a 24 volt system. When you get to a 48 volt battery system, it's the widest range of options because uh, traditionally 48 volts has been the off-grid standard for many homes. Uh, and it gives you a huge range of quality inverters that work at 48 volts. You can go higher for bigger systems, but we're looking at nine kilowatt hours per day energy demand. So we don't need a massive uh, battery system running at really high voltages. So we're being uh, conservative here and going for a nominal 48 volt system. Now, first up, 48 volts really is uh, referring to two volt cells in series for lead acid. So you'd have 24 two volt cells in series, and that would give you a 48 volt nominal battery bank. But we're going to do a system using lithium ion batteries and lithium ion uh, these are lithium ferrophosphate that i'm going to use for this example have a nominal voltage of about 52 volts so for step b we're going to choose a nominal voltage for our system of 52 volts and we're choosing lithium uh, 
mainly because of the ability to fully deeply discharge these batteries to like 80 or 90 percent and also for cost reasons i think lithium now has starting to beat lead acid even on off-grid applications on price well certainly in australia and new zealand now, step three is we actually have to work out what the losses in the system is. We call this the load subsystem efficiency factor. It's a big word uh, or words. Uh, what that is, is consider the losses in a storage system and a uh, power being delivered to a load. And the obvious losses are the energy that you put into the battery system isn't fully recouped. We call that round trip efficiency. So the round trip efficiency of a lithium ion battery is pretty good. It's up in the sort of around about 95%. Uh, the round trip efficiency of a lead acid system is much lower, more like 85%. Uh, that's the nature of the chemistry. So since we're using lithium, we're going to choose an efficiency uh, of 95% for our lithium battery, the round trip efficiency. And from a mathematical point of view, it's easier to talk about factors for efficiency. So a factor of one is 100% efficient, a factor of 0.95 is 95% efficient. So that's what we'll do. We've got an efficiency factor for uh, the round trip of the energy in and out of our battery of 0.95. Uh, next is the wiring losses. Because the energy's got to go over a cable to get into the battery, and it's got to come back out of that cable and then go through equipment, conversion equipment, probably an inverter, and supply a load. There's some losses in that process. Now, the wiring rules in Australia and New Zealand, AS NZS 5000, say the maximum voltage drop to the most remote part of a circuit is 5%. So I'd suggest that you try and keep your wiring losses below 5%. So that, in an unusual way to refer to it, is an efficiency factor of 95%. So your wiring system is 95% efficient, therefore it's a factor of 0.95. Lastly, in the load subsystem efficiency factors, we've got to consider the conversion equipment. From going from DC at 52 volts to AC uh, at probably 230 volts. So that's a battery inverter. Now battery inverters have a tougher job to do than a solar inverter. They've got to take uh, an extra low voltage source, typically in this case a 52 volt lithium ion battery, and uh, elevate that up to 230 volts AC. And so that process is, is a little less efficient than say just a, a solar inverter converting high voltage DC to uh, AC. So the efficiency factor is about 92 to 94% for a battery inverter these days, a quality battery inverter. I'm gonna go to the lower end just to be conservative. You've also got to consider um, the, um, the load level of the inverter, so at low load levels, Battery inverters are less efficient. They actually get better as you increase the, the, uh, the load on them. That's because their own self-use becomes less significant. They've always got a little bit of self-use, you know, 20 or 30 watts is just being consumed by the electronics basically running the, the inverter. So 0.92 is the efficiency factor for the inverter. Now from a mathematics point of view, to cluster all that together as a single sum or um, is to multiply those three factors together. So 0.95 times 0.95 times 0.92 gives us 0.83. Overall, our load subsystem efficiency is 83% or 0.83 as a factor. Okay, getting there. So that's step three of six. Three more to go. Uh, step four, is really just a simple formula, which is we take our load energy, uh, we divide it by our battery system voltage, and we divide that by our load subsystem efficiency factor, and we'll find out the amp hour demand per day from our battery system. So uh, 9,000 watt hours divided by 52 volts divided by a load subsystem efficiency factor of 0.83 gives us 209 amp hours per day of energy demand from our battery. All right, so we know what we're drawing out of our battery, 209 amp hours per day to deliver to our loads 9,000 watt hours per day. Two more steps to go. Now this one's probably the hardest. It's got quite a few factors in it, but I'm gonna simplify it a little bit here for you, or quite a lot actually, which is how do we size the PV? Now, one of the tricks with sizing PV is basically oversizing. You can find out what the right size is, uh, 
But oversizing, certainly with the low cost of solar panels these days, helps a lot in the design. It means the battery system can recover quicker, quicker after a period of bad weather. It means that your battery system basically hardly works during the day because if you've got enough PV to cover your loads and charge your batteries, really your batteries are only being used at night time. So um, batteries are generally more expensive as an energy source than solar, so oversizing PV really helps. But we're gonna do right sizing and then up to you how much oversizing you put in there as a factor. So we start with our load energy requirement, 9,000 watt hours per day. We divide it by the peak sun hours for our site and for the roof uh, array or the um, surface that we're gonna put our solar panels on. Now, peak sun hours, is really a measure of the energy falling per square meter uh, on a surface at a certain time of the year and uh, for a certain period. So we want the peak, the daily peak sun hours. More technically, these are called kilowatt hours per square meter for a surface. And those are a little bit difficult to find. Uh, in Australia, the Bureau of Meteorology does give you peak sun hours uh, in megajoules and in kilowatt hours per square meter for a horizontal surface. But unless you're putting your panels perfectly horizontal, uh, you need to make some adjustments for inclination and azimuth. Now there's no easy way to convert from horizontal to inclined and azimuth adjusted, i.e. which direction of the compass are they facing. Uh, that's where you need to have some uh, pretty clever software to do this. Now my company Solar Plus actually does this through its own internal solar radiation engine and calculates that for you. Um, there are some free sources on the internet uh, with their limitations. So uh, the US site NASA actually has a tool for this. Um, in New Zealand, NIWA has a tool for this. NIWA is the meteorological service for New Zealand. Um, but many of those don't give you all the options, like all the azimuths and all the inclinations. Sometimes they'll just give you equator facing panels, i.e. here in the southern hemisphere, that means north facing at an optimum tilt angle. So. We're gonna look them up using the software in Solar Plus and find out for a surface uh, facing true north and it's based in Melbourne. Now, why is that important? Well, um, the peak sun hours change dramatically as the, you move away from the equator. So basically, as you move away from the equator, generally you'll get less peak sun hours uh, and also there'll be more seasonal variation. Now this is one of the big cruxes of a standalone power system design. If you want 100% solar fraction, you really want to design a system for the worst load resource ratio. That means the worst ratio between how much renewable energy is coming in from the solar versus how much load energy is going out. And uh, in a temperate climate like Melbourne here in Victoria, that's basically winter time. Winter time is generally the toughest month because we get about a third as much solar in winter time as we do in summer. Uh, the days are shorter, so you're often inside more and therefore probably using a bit more energy. Uh, so we're gonna make the design month for our example, June, which is the toughest month to meet the load energy requirement. And in June, a north facing array tilted at uh, say 30 degrees to the north will produce about 2.7 peak sun hours or 2.7 kilowatt hours per square meter. Now that number is the solar resource. Uh, we're going to find out how much energy uh, a solar panel produces. Uh, so we start with the watt energy requirement uh, in terms of watt hours, 9,000 watt hours, divide that by the peak sun hours for our site, 2.7. And then we need to also factor in the losses on the generation side. Now there's quite a few losses in a PV system. The biggest one generally is the thermal losses. That means as a panel heats up, it loses power. A 300 watt panel is only 300 watts at standard test conditions, which is when the cells are at 25 degrees Celsius and they're receiving 1,000 watts per square meter, which is full sun. Now that doesn't really happen unless you're in a freezing cold place, because as soon as you put 1,000 watts per square meter full sun onto a solar panel, it heats up. It heats up about 25 to 35 degrees, depending on how it's mounted. So that um, additional heating up in locations like Melbourne means that the panels will derate. They won't be producing their full power. So the derating we need to factor in. Now I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because this is actually where graphs come in and coefficients for power loss, etc. But I'm going to assume about 
um, 8% loss in winter. Now that's because it's cold here. In fact, I'm doing this for Mount Tuliburong, which is pretty damn cold in winter, like 0 to 5 degrees in June. Uh, so we are um, only getting about 8% loss in full sun in June on our PV system. So our factor for efficiency is 0.92 for thermal. Uh, we've got wiring losses in our DC cables from our solar array to our solar inverter or charge controller, whichever you choose. And that's a self-inflicted loss. Really, um, you can choose how much loss there is in a system by choosing the cable. Now, the recommendation in our wiring rules, uh, sorry, in, in our PV array standard 5033, is uh, it should be less than 3%. Now, it is a should. It's not a shell. That means it's, it's a recommendation. Uh, but I reckon you can do a whole lot better than that. Uh, it's pretty easy with higher voltages that solar inverters run at. Uh, you can keep that pretty low. And even with charge controllers these days, they're getting up in the you know many hundreds of volts now. So you should be able to keep it below 1% with reasonable length of cable. So we're putting in 1% loss for our DC wiring from our PV array to our solar inverter or charge controller. So that's a factor of 0.99. Next up is the charge controller's conversion efficiency is going from DC to AC if it's a solar inverter or from DC to DC, a different voltage for the battery, if it's a charge controller. And therefore, um, there's a certain conversion losses in there. Now, we're doing an AC coupled system for this example, and a solar inverter is pretty efficient. Um, about 97% is typical. Charge controllers are often better than that, 98, 99, and 99 and a bit even. So uh, in this case, we're going to have a efficiency factor for a conversion of our solar DC uh, to AC with a solar inverter of 0.97. Now there's a few other things you can consider, but I'm going to say I'm going to put one more in there because it's, it's a kind of a given that you're going to have dirt occasionally. So there's going to be some dust and dirt on the panels and therefore they won't necessarily be performing at their peak. So a good rule of thumb is put something in there. That's not really a rule of thumb. That's just do something. Uh, if you don't know otherwise, um, I'd recommend put in 5% as a dust and dirt derating. Uh, if you live in a dry, dusty environment, it's probably going to be significantly higher than that. But then again, um, our design month is winter time. Winter in Melbourne is often wet. So I'm pretty confident that 5% for dust and dirt is, uh, is ample. So those derating factors for our generation system all get multiplied together. So we've got 0.92 for thermal losses, uh, 0.99 for wiring losses, 0.97 for inverter losses, and 0.95 for dust and dirt. We multiply those all together and we get 0.84. You with me still? Quite a few calculations, they'll be on the screen. The last one is we need to divide by our load subsystem efficiency. Basically, we've got to produce more energy than the load needs because we've got to produce it for the losses on the generation and the losses on the load side. So, the final answer is dividing 9,000 watt hours per day by a peak sun hour of 2.7 by a PV generation efficiency factor of 0.84 and divide it by a load subsystem efficiency of 0.83. And that brings us up to a sum of 4,781 watts of panels. Okay, 4.8 kilowatts of panels is the minimum system size for a pretty much 100% solar fraction to meet those nine kilowatt hours per day in Melbourne in winter. Now, remember that's not real watts, that's the nameplate rating of the panels, that's what you'd go and purchase. Uh, so you'd go and purchase 4.8 kilowatts of PV or uh, solar panels to meet that load energy requirement in winter time. Of course, in summertime when you've got <laughs> three times as much power, you're gonna be rocking it. You're gonna have heaps of surplus uh, energy and that's when you can be a bit more um, liberal with you know, running aircon a lot, um, using electricity for things like heating water, cooking. Uh, so it's a kind of seasonal change. But remember, oversizing your PV often gives you lots of advantages. So don't rule out just doubling it. I even say just double it anyway, so that you minimize the use of batteries uh, during the day in wintertime. And therefore, you really extend your days of autonomy. Now we're coming to that lastly. 
So we've done steps one to five, one more to go, size the battery system, and then we're done, and we'll close it off. So the last step is actually really quite easy. Um, we start with uh, the uh, amount of amp hour demand, which is 209 amp hours per day. We multiply that by the uh, number of days of autonomy. Now, this whole formula is, is a kind of dumbed down version of the Australian New Zealand standard ASNZS 4509.2, which has 16 pages of formulas telling you how to do this. Uh, I've dumbed it down because we don't have to be that precise anymore. Uh, maybe you do if you're doing an engineered solution, something that's really critical, but for a home, I think you can dumb it down quite a lot and still be good enough. Certainly if you oversize the PV. So what is the right number of days of autonomy? Now, 4509 now part two tells us that for a system with an auto start generator, a minimum of two days of autonomy is recommended. And for a system without an auto start generator, a minimum of five days of autonomy is recommended. So somewhere between two and five would be typical, but it's up to you. You might want to look at the weather cycles, for instance, and find what the average weather cycles for the site are, looking at the historical weather data, and you might size it for that. You might find that, you know, four days is the average weather cycle, so that's a good period of autonomy. If you have it less than the recommended amount, it just means you might be running a generator, uh, a backup generator more often, particularly uh, during the worst month of the year when the uh, load resource ratio is at its lowest. So we're picking three. We're picking, it's kind of not the minimum, not the maximum, somewhere in the middle, three days of autonomy. The last step is to divide um, the sum of amp hours times days, uh, days of autonomy by the maximum depth of discharge of our battery system. Now, if you're familiar with lead acid, it's kind of generally considered that 50% maximum depth of discharge is a good working figure for a reasonable life out of a lead acid system. But we're using lithium, and lithium can be discharged much deeper, and it has way more cycles than a lead acid system. So since we're you know, going to discharge, uh, in this case, 90% of the uh, rated capacity of the battery, uh, we're going to put in a, um, a 0.9 factor for maximum depth of discharge. So the sums are 209 amp hours times three days divided by 0.9 tells us that we need 697 amp hours of battery capacity at 52 volts. So that's it. We've gone from step one to six. We've sized our PV, we've sized our battery system. Uh, if you want to know what 697 amp hours at 52 volts looks like in kilowatt hours, you just multiply them together and divide by 1,000. And so that turns out to be 36 kilowatt hours of battery capacity. That's the, the nameplate rating of the battery. And of course, uh, you're using 90% of that uh, as a maximum depth of discharge over those three days of autonomy. Doesn't mean every day you use 90%. You need, uh, in this case, um, you use 30% each day uh, for three days. That gets you down to 90% maximum depth of discharge. So there you go. It's not rocket science. It does require a bit of investigation, a bit of maths, and also please look at energy efficiency deeply and do that first. Uh, that's where the biggest savings in designing a standalone power system are. So if you've got any questions or comments, please uh, put them below and I'll read them uh, when I get back to this and answer them as best I can. But if you're interested in courses I run, I actually run a five half day course. So it's four hour sessions for five days in a row. Uh, and it's exactly about this. Now we go into a lot more depth. We also look at maximum demand calculations for inverters. We discuss all the different battery chemistries and their use cases uh, and a lot more. So if you want a really in-depth course, uh, go to solarquip.com. Uh, I'll also put that in the description below and uh, you'll be able to uh, enroll in one of my courses. So I do the five-day course for standalone power systems. I do a shorter course on just uh, standards for those who are installers who just want to up, brush up on the standards for solar and batteries. I even do a two-day crash course, and that's coming up next month in February. I think it's the 17th and 18th of February in the evening, 4.30 to 8.30 p.m. Melbourne time, and it's just a battery standards crash course. So there you go. Uh, lots of resources for you. If you like this channel, don't, um, don't forget to give us a, a thumbs up and uh, subscribe if you're on YouTube or follow us if you're on Facebook uh, or LinkedIn. So thanks very much, everyone. And I'll be back with another live Toolbox Tech Talk next week. See ya.